Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our regular 2.30 daily briefing. Uh, again, today I'd like to begin by asking Dr. Zike to give us the medical update for the day. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon, everyone. So for today, we have, over the last 24 hours, run 14,974 tests with 2,270 being positive. That's a 15% positivity rate. We've run a total of 361,260 tests for COVID-19. And we've had a total of 68,232 total cases. Over the last 24 hours, we were alerted to 136 new COVID deaths, which brings our death total to 2,974. In the hospital, we have 4,832 individuals who are hospitalized with COVID-19 illness. Of those in the hospital, 1,231 are in the ICU and 780 patients are currently on ventilators. I briefly touched on this yesterday, but I want to assure everyone that regardless of the ability to pay, not having insurance, or regardless of citizenship status, COVID-19 is available and covered for everyone. Many vulnerable populations are being affected by this pandemic, and none more than the Latinx population. The IDPH equity team has been tasked with identifying the needs of communities of color across the state during the COVID-19 response. Our testing strategies work group has reviewed current testing protocols policies and capacity to ensure that disparity of higher mortality rates in communities of color is curbed. As Latinx communities across Illinois are being hit hard by this virus, I urge trusted community leaders to help get the word out about the availability of COVID-19 testing. There are 120 federally qualified health centers conducting free testing many of them like the Greater Elgin Family Care Center in Northern Illinois, with clinics in Elgin, McHenry, Sycamore, Hanover Park, Streamwood, and Wheeling, more than 63% of the patients they serve are Latinx. These clinics are anchors in the communities of color, and I thank Governor Pritzker for making testing a number one priority in these areas across the state. But of course, we need to do even more. The Latinx population has become the group with the highest proportion of positive cases in Illinois. And there, of, of the data that we've collected, we know that there are some uh, cases that we don't have information, so potentially the numbers are higher. IDPH has created a data work group that is working on ways to improve the data collection for different racial and ethnic groups. Refining techniques and types of data collected helps us to better understand clusters of positive cases as may be seen in multi-generational living spaces. This will help us get a clear view of how COVID-19 is affecting our Latinx communities. Our communication work group is focused on providing guidance on developing culturally and linguistically appropriate messaging around COVID-19. Please remember that the IDPH COVID-19 texting messaging program provides daily text messages in Spanish with testing guidance and self-care information. Test COVID ESP to 312-500-3836. Again, that's COVID ESP, text that to 312-500-3836 to get daily messages. Remember, there are things we can do to stop the spread of this virus. We must continue to stay home. We must cover our face. If we do have to go outside, we must frequently wash our hands for 20 seconds with soap. Let's continue to do that. Let's get through this pandemic and restore Illinois together. And now I'll review comments in Spanish. Buenos tardes. 
hemos probado un total de 361,260 pruebas para COVID-19, con 14,974 hechos en las últimas 24 horas. Hoy reportamos 2,270 casos nuevos de COVID-19 por un total de 68,232. Desde ayer, 136 muertes con COVID-19 fueron reportados y en total hay 2,974 muertes en el estado. Hasta la medianoche informó que 4,832 personas en Illinois estaban en el hospital con COVID-19. De ellos, 1,231 pacientes estaban en la unidad de cuidados intensivos y 780 pacientes estaban en ventiladores. Ayer hablé un poco de esto, pero quiero asegurar a todos, no importa su capacidad de pagar, no tener seguro de salud o si no eres ciudadano, las pruebas COVID-19 son gratis para todos. Muchas poblaciones vulnerables están afectadas por esta pandemia y ninguna más que la po población latinex. El equipo de equidad de IDPH se ha encargado de identificar las necesidades de las comunidades de color en, en todo el estado durante esta respuesta de COVID-19. Nuestro grupo de pruebas ha revisado, ha re, revisado las pólizas y la capacidad de pruebas para garantizar servicios en las comunidades de color. Las comunidades latinex en Illinois están golpeadas por este virus. Pido a los líderes de la comunidad para que ayudan, ayuden a correr la voz sobre las pruebas de COVID-19 en sus barrios. Hay 120 clínicas federales que realizan pruebas gratis, muchos de ellos como Greater Elgin Family Care Center en el norte del estado, con clínicas en Elgin, McHenry, Sycamore, Hanover Park, Streamwood y Wheeling, más de 63% de los pacientes que sirven son Latinx. Estas clínicas son anclas en nuestras comunidades de color. Agradezco al gobernador Pritzker por hacer que las pruebas sean una prioridad en estas áreas por el estado. Pero por supuesto, necesitamos hacer más. La población de Latinx se ha convertido en, un, en el grupo con la mayor porcentaje de casos positivos de COVID-19. Con el número de casos positivos y muertes desconocidas, esos números pueden ser mucho más altos. IDPH ha creado un grupo de datos que están trabajando en formas de mejorar la colección de datos para grupos raciales, raciales y étnicos. Refinando estos datos nos ayuda a comprender los grupos de casos positivos, por ejemplo, casas donde viven familias grandes. Eso nos da una visión clara de cómo COVID-19 está afectando a las personas latinex. Nuestro grupo de comunicación concentra sobre el desarrollo de mensajes apropiados en su idioma para aprender más de COVID-19. Además, el programa de mensajes de texto IDPH COVID-19 manda mensajes de textos diarios en español con importante uh, información. Manda el mensaje COVID ISP a 312-500-3836. Recuerdo, debemos continuar quedarse en casa cuando podemos. Debemos cubrirnos la, la cara cuando necesitamos salir. Con frecuencia debemos lavarnos las manos con jabón. Si continuamos haciendo eso, superaremos esta pandemia y salimos de estos juntas. Muchísimas gracias. And with that, I would like to turn it back over to Governor Pritzker. Thank you, Dr. Azike. <clears throat> The doctor and I are joined here today by the Illinois Hispanic Chamber of Commerce's president and CEO, Jaime DiPaolo. 
as well as Dr. Marina Del Rios, who's the Director of Social Emergency Medicine and Associate Professor of Clinical Emergency Medicine at the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Medicine. In Illinois' response to COVID-19, I have said since the beginning that we are operating with a specific focus on our residents who are most vulnerable to the effects of this virus. Our seniors, our immunocompromised individuals, and people who have pre-existing conditions. And because of decades of disparities in healthcare access and delivery, we've seen the worst effects of this pandemic fall upon disproportionately upon the, black, the backs of the communities of color in our state. That's especially true in our black communities, our Native American communities, and our Latinx communities. Jaime Di Paolo and Dr. Del Rios have joined our daily public update because I want to bring more attention to the work all of us are doing to support our more vulnerable populations, especially the Latinx community, which is now testing positive for COVID-19 at the highest rate of any demographic group in Illinois. Although nearly half of those who have been tested did not fill out their demographic information, of those who did, 7.6% self-identified as Hispanic. Of these more than 26,000 individuals, nearly 16,000 of them have tested positive for COVID-19. That's a positivity rate of 60%. That's nearly three times our state average. As a point of comparison, for the half of people who left their race blank on their forms, about 18,000 tested positive for the virus. That's 10%. We don't know what portion of those unknowns might also qualify as Hispanic or Latinx, but what we do know is that our data from the start until today shines a concerning spotlight on which of our residents are most likely to get sick from COVID-19. Decades of institutional inequities and obstacles for members of our Latinx communities are now amplified in this pandemic. And while we can't fix generations of history in the span of a few months, we must advance equity in our public health response today, everywhere and anywhere we can. My administration has made it a priority to enter into testing partnerships in as many areas around the state as possible, with a focus on communities home to significant populations who are more vulnerable to this virus. We now have over 200 public testing sites in Illinois, a third of which are located in communities with a significant Latinx population, measured here as greater than or equal to 17%, which is the Latino population number statewide. The reason many of our partners in Latinx communities have been chosen is not just for their locations, but also their accessibility to other services, particularly language services. Under the 1964 Civil Rights Act, all U.S. hospitals receiving federal funds are required to provide language services to patients with limited English proficiency. But in practice, some are better equipped than others. Another bullet point on the long list of features about our national medical system that deserves extra attention in the post-crisis management world. So in bringing in our public partners in the Latino communities, we are proactively focused on community health centers that prioritize accessible services and are often home to bilingual staff, such as Alivio Health Center, Erie Family Health Center, VNA Healthcare, Esperanza Health, Howard Brown and Greater Elgin Family Care Center. Additionally, of the seven drive-through sites that the state does formally run, each offers bilingual support for Spanish speakers. And as we build on our existing contact tracing abilities at local health departments, we will continue to make a push for robust relationships with trusted partners in Latino communities and ensure our tracking capabilities reflect Illinois' multilingual diversity. 
On another note, I want to reiterate that we are providing housing for those who need assistance with self-isolation if they've been exposed to or diagnosed with COVID-19. Across the state, there are multi-generational families of all backgrounds living under one roof. And especially in our cities, we have families and roommates living in smaller apartment units that make self-isolating much more difficult. To support our residents who need help to quarantine in a safe space, the state has made available thousands of free hotel rooms for residents who may need to move out of their home as a precautionary measure to make sure they keep their families or their roommates safe. These hotel rooms offer full wraparound services, including meals and medical assistance. And again, they are entirely free for anyone. They can access this housing support by contacting their county or city public health departments. The Illinois Department of Human Services has also utilized our Illinois Welcoming Centers as a hub for free resources for our immigrant communities, some of whom are also members of the Latino community. That's everything from emergency funds to provide food and necessities to enrollment in SNAP and WIC benefits to testing location information. Additionally, the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights has worked with welcoming centers to distribute information about these services to a wider audience. For more information on our welcoming centers, I hope you'll go visit dhs.illinois.gov slash help I-S-H-E-R-E. That's help is here. I want to say that again, dhs.illinois.gov slash help is here and then click Help at Home. In today's conversation, I also want to address workers' rights in the midst of this crisis. This pandemic has exacerbated existing socioeconomic inequalities, and that affects many communities, including the Latinx community. I want to ensure that everyone listening knows where to go if you believe an employer in your area is not following CDC guidelines regarding safe and sanitary practices in the workplace. The Illinois Attorney General's Workplace Rights Bureau, the Illinois Department of Labor, and the U.S. Department of Labor are investigating and enforcing CDC guidelines in non-compliant facilities. It is in everybody's best interest for these essential workplaces to take every precaution necessary to protect their workers. Employers who are bad actors need to be held to account. For public employers such as the state or local governments, public works departments, police and fire departments, complaints should be submitted to the Illinois OSHA through the Illinois Department of Labor. For private sector employees like gas employers, sorry, like gas stations, restaurants, and manufacturers, direct complaints to federal OSHA. Both of those reporting mechanisms can be found on the Illinois Department of Labor website at illinois.gov slash IDOL. Employees from both the private and public sectors can submit a complaint with the Illinois Attorney General's Workplace Rights Bureau also. I want to also address the mask or face covering requirement that took effect on May 1st. At this time, face coverings are required in public situations where social distance cannot be maintained, and that applies only to those who are medically able to wear a mask. I recognize that this is a new practice for many in Illinois and the entire United States, but it's on us to change how we think about face coverings. Protecting your fellow Americans by wearing a face covering in public is a collective act of patriotism. And doctors will tell you it's one of the best things that we can do for public health right now. There have been reports of misplaced assumptions about masks leading to incidents of racial profiling against Latinx and black Americans, especially men, as well as xenophobic attacks against Asian Americans. And I want to call on the public 
to help us stop these hateful incidents by speaking out and standing up for others in your community. If you witness or experience mask-related discrimination or any form of discrimination, please report the incident to the Illinois Department of Human Rights at idhr.webmail at illinois.gov. Let me say that again. You can send an email to idhr.webmail at illinois.gov. Finally, while there are so many individuals and organizations that are doing critical work at this moment, I want to recognize some of the folks who have played a particularly important role in shaping the state's response in this pandemic, especially to the challenges facing communities of color, ensuring that the Latino community is well represented in our decisions as well as our solutions. First, the IDPH COVID-19 Equity Task Force, which works to develop plans and communication strategies to reach communities of color and other vulnerable populations, including regarding the long-term mental and physical consequences of the pandemic. And of course, I want to recognize the contributions of the entire Legislative Latino Caucus, co-chairs Representative Lisa Hernandez and Senator Omar Aquino, as well as a few individuals who have been incredible voices for justice and in helping with outreach in their districts, Representative Karina Villa on manufacturing issues, Representative Fred Crespo on education, Representative Selena Villanueva on public health, and Representative Delia Ramirez on housing. My team and I are working with communities across the state to address ongoing challenges, as well as to strengthen the efforts of trusted leaders already advancing COVID-19 awareness and prevention. Yesterday would have been the annual Latino Unity Day in Springfield, my second as governor. Last year, I was so proud to join the Legislative Latino Caucus, my deputy governors, Sol Flores and Jesse Ruiz, members of my cabinet who are teachers and nurses, our union workers and labor leaders, our police officers, our firefighters, state legislators and mayors, the people who help make Illinois the greatest state in the nation. This year, we can't gather like once we did. But I'll say again, what I said then, the Latino community is the Illinois community. We are in these fights and all these fights we are in together. Thank you, and now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Marina Del Rios. Doctor. Buenas tardes. Um, I'm gonna have some remarks in Spanish and then I'll and move on to English. El virus COVID-19 ha tenido un profundo impacto en nuestra comunidad hispana. Los latinos representan más del 40% de los casos nuevos reportados en el estado de Illinois durante la última semana, y nuestros números continúan creciendo. Muchos de nosotros no podemos quedarnos en casa porque trabajamos en áreas esenciales de la economía, incluyendo las fábricas, servicios médicos, el transporte público, el servicio y la seguridad pública. Y tenemos un mayor riesgo de quedar expuestos a COVID-19 y llevarlo a nuestras familias. Pero podemos tomar medidas para limitar propagación en la comunidad. Las medidas más simples de higiene son nuestra primera línea de defensa. Utilizar una máscara, mantener una distancia de seis pies mientras trabaja, lavarse las manos con frecuencia y... Añadir a eso, quitarse la ropa y ducharse inmediatamente al regresar a su casa después de trabajar. Estas medidas reducirán el riesgo de transmisión del virus entre sus compañeros de trabajo y de su familia. Estar en buen estado de salud es su mejor oportunidad para protegerse del COVID-19. Si tiene alguna enfermedad crónica como diabetes, hipertensión o asma, continúe trabajando con su médico de atención primaria para mantenerse saludable. Los hospitales y consultorios médicos todavía están abiertos y muchos ofrecen opciones para comunicarse por videoconferencia con su proveedor médico. Finalmente, reconocemos que para muchos de nosotros, tomar un día libre del trabajo puede tener importantes repercusiones financieras. Sin embargo, hay mayores repercusiones en retrasar la atención médica cuando está enfermo. Sabiendo esto, es importante 
que si tiene algún síntoma que sugiera que pueda tener COVID-19, tómese un tiempo libre del trabajo y busque atención médica de inmediato por su propia seguridad y la de sus compañeros de trabajo y de su familia. Hay más lugares en la comunidad donde ofrecen pruebas sin costo y, estin, y están disponibles para los miembros de nuestra comunidad, independientemente del estado de ciudadanía. Y, aunque no tenemos una cura para este virus, sí existen terapias que podemos ofrecer para controlar sus síntomas y evitar la progresión a una enfermedad más grave. Gracias por la invitación para hablar con ustedes. Exhorto a las personas a visitar nuestro sitio de web, illinoisunidos.com, para obtener información sobre recursos disponibles en nuestra comunidad. Que sigan saludables. And now I'll say my remarks in English for the Spanish deficient audience. COVID-19 has had a profound impact in the Latino community. Latinos represent more than 40% of new cases reported in the state of Illinois over the last week, and our numbers are continuing to grow. I know personally I have been in impacted losing friends and family members of friends. Many of us are unable to stay home because we work in essential areas of the economy, including factories, healthcare, public transportation, service, and public safety, and have a higher risk of getting exposed to COVID-19 and bringing it home to our families. But we can take measures to limit community spread. As Dr. Ezekiel shared, simple hygiene measures are our first line of defense. Wearing a mask and keeping a six foot distance while at work. Wash your hands frequently. Remove your clothes and shower immediately upon returning home. These measures will reduce the risk of transmission of the virus among your coworkers and your family. Having a baseline state of good, a baseline state of good health is your best chance to protect yourself from COVID-19. If you have any chronic illness, such as diabetes, hypertension, or asthma, or others, continue working with your primary care doctor to manage your health. Hospitals and doctor's office are still open for business, and many offer options for telemedicine. Finally, we recognize that many of us, for many of us, taking a day off from work can have significant financial repercussions. However, there are larger repercussions in delaying medical attention when you are sick. Knowing this, my final take home point for my community is, if you have any symptoms suggestive of COVID-19, take time off from work and seek medical attention immediately for your own safety and for that of your coworkers and family. There are more community sites that are offering testing at no cost and are available to our community members regardless of citizen citizenship status. And while we do not have a cure for this virus, there are therapies we can offer to manage your symptoms and avoid progression to more severe disease. Thank you for the invitation to speak today, and I welcome people to visit the Illinois Latino COVID-19 Coalition's website, illinoisunidos.com, illinoisunidos.com, for information on resources available to our community. Stay safe, everyone. And I'd like to invite to the podium now Mr. Jaime Di Paolo. Uh, buenas tardes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Del Rios, for the, your kind introduction. Uh, Governor Prickster, thank you for inviting me to speak this afternoon. Uh, the Latino Hispanic business community really appreciates what you've been doing for us. Thank you so much. Second, I'd like to thank the Illinois Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. Uh, those are uh, fully committed people with the right heart, fully committed to a vision and where we're going. Uh, the, uh, my name is Jaime Di Paulo. I am the President and CEO of the Illinois Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. The Illinois Hispanic Chamber of Commerce mission is, is to cultivate knowledge, connections, and collaborations to effect transform, transformational change to achieve sustainable economic impact throughout entrepreneurship. In 2019, we helped thousands of business open and get started, and we helped over, uh, create hundreds of jobs, served over 760 businesses, in coordination with the Illinois Small Business Development Center that we happen to have an office in our office and provided over 2,500 hours of counseling hours of bilingual programs and resources to our clients. Over the past few weeks, we have received thousands of inquiries, uh, inquiries from Illinois business owners across Illinois. This is why we activated a bilingual phone uh, call center so business owners can call and inquire and get the right answers. Uh, our team has dedicated 100% of our efforts in working with the Illinois Hispanic Business, uh, Small Business Development Center and have 
answered hundreds of clients with the necessary tools for them to access all loan programs, in particular the PPP program. We have developed close relationships with few financial institutions, and I must say about 90% or more of our referrals have obtained the very important loan, and this is why uh, they like what we do, because we arm people with the right tools, the right applications, and the right things to ask, and this is why our, our community is getting the loans. Uh, all businesses stay open with one and one and one coaching. Uh, pretty soon we're gonna launch a new program, and we, we are developing to work on it. So what we're trying to do is, is go to phase two of our chamber to work with businesses on one-on-one -on -one and, and, and get them the, the right tools and information so they can stay in business. As you know, many Hispanic businesses have been impacted by this public health crisis, and the majority are small businesses. While the amount of information can feel overwhelming, and, and the need for more business community will continue to grow, our focus has been and guide our Hispanic small businesses owners to available resources and, and give them the right information. We are here to help and we will continue to assist Hispanic business owners across the state. All you gotta do is give us a call, 312-423-9500. Feel free to call us. If we don't answer the phone, leave a message, we'll get back to you. Or send us a note at info at business at iccbusiness.net. As small businesses pay an absolutely critical role in the fabric of our communities in our state. This is why I urge all small businesses to follow the guidance issued by Governor Prickster and his administrations uh, as many businesses start to reopen. The safety and well-being of our communities is priority number one. I urge all employees of small businesses to contact their local health department or local authorities if your employer is not following the guidance uh, issued throughout the governor's executive order. All business begin to, as business begin to safely reopen, we have a plan to provide personal assistance to many Hispanic business owners that continue to struggle. Our organization and community have overcome many crises, and together we will overcome, we will overcome this one. Thank you, and ahora voy a decirlo, en, now I'm gonna say in Spanish or Spanish community listeners. Muchas gracias, Gobernador Prexter, por tenernos aquí esta tarde. De verdad, apreciamos todo lo que ha hecho por nosotros. Mi nombre es Jaime Di Pablo, soy el presidente y director ejecutivo de la Cámara Hispana del Estado de Illinois. La misión de la Cámara de Comercio Hispana de Illinois es cultivar el conocimiento, conexiones y colaboración para generar un efecto transformacional en la sociedad y alcanzar una economía sustentable por medio del emprendimiento. Durante el 2019, hemos podido ayudar a muchísimos negocios y que empezar sus, sus, sus operaciones. Hemos creado sobre más de cientos de trabajos, de puestos de empleo. Hemos servido a más de 760 miembros de la Cámara de Comercio y hemos previsto más de 2,500 horas de consejería por medio de nuestros programas y recursos. Durante las semanas pasadas hemos recibido miles de preguntas y preocupaciones de dueños de pequeños negocios latinos de, de Illinois y por eso nos hemos activado el Centro de Llamadas Bilingüe para poder responder a todas sus preguntas y nuestro equipo se ha comprometido y dedicado a un 100% de este trabajo. Nuestro Centro de Desarrollo de para Pequeñas Empresas de Illinois ha ayudado a cientos de clientes con la guía y las herramientas necesarias para que puedan acceder a todos los préstamos y programas y subsidios que ofrece el Estado, la ciudad, el municipio o a, a corporaciones privadas. Y quiero informarles que gracias a, a, a la ayuda que hemos dado, hemos ayudado a miles de gentes y el 90% de, estas, de estos empresarios han obtenido sus préstamos gracias a la ayuda que hemos dado. Estamos aquí para ayudar y, continu y continuaremos ayudando a todos los dueños y y de pequeños negocios del Estado. Todo lo que tiene que hacer es comunicarse con nosotros bien fácil, 312-425-9500 o envíanos un correo a info arroba, ihccbusiness.net o búscanos en las redes sociales, ahí te damos toda la información, acuérdate, estamos aquí para ayudarte. Los pequeños negocios juegan un rol crítico en la comunidad y por eso los llamamos a seguir todos los lineamientos del gobierno, del gobernador Prickster y su administración. Mientras varios 
están reabriendo sus puertas, nuestra prioridad número uno es la seguridad y bienestar de nuestra comunidad. También insto a los empleos de pequeñas empresas a comunicarse con el Departamento de Salud local o las autoridades competentes si su patrón o empleador no está siguiendo los lineamientos expuestos por el, por el gobernador en su decreto ejecutivo. Mientras los negocios comienzan a reabrir de una manera segura, nosotros tenemos un plan de, de brindar asistencia de uno a uno para asegurarnos que su negocio tenga éxito. Con esto, with this, I will turn it over to Governor Prickster to answer any questions. Thank you, Governor. Thank Craig, you we're going to start with questions online today, and then we'll go to you. Jim Haggerty at Rock River Times. Governor, what would you say to those who say Democratic governors are trying to keep their states closed for as long as possible in order to make better cases for federal bailout funds? I can only speak for this Democratic governor, and I certainly have talked to a, no a number of others. And I'll just say that uh, we are listening to the scientists and the epidemiologists, the doctors, about what's best for the people who live in our states, and that's what we're doing, all of us. Indeed, I've talked to many of the governors across the nation. Uh, they have shared their epidemiological findings as well. They're experts with us, and we have terrific ones here that we've shared with them. Cisco Coto from WBBM News Radio. Can the governor provide more clarity to churches regarding holding services? Should they plan not to hold services larger than 50 people until their region has moved to phase five? Um, well, you know that in phase three, there, there can be gatherings, church gatherings of 10 or fewer, in phase four, 50 or fewer. So that's the guidance that's been given to me. I'm not the one providing that guidance. It really is what the scientists and epidemiologists are recommending. Shia Politico, Governor, as an entrepreneur at heart, could you talk about what areas of business and industry you see emerging post-pandemic and, and if and how they might benefit state government? Boy, that is really interesting. Uh, so I, I guess I, I'll just say that I think there are going to be a number of new uh, businesses that get started as a result of this. Uh, I think you've already seen uh, that at least before there is a vaccine, there are lots of entrepreneurs who have uh, started uh, uh, mask and face covering businesses, um, others who are trying to address the medical needs that are associated with uh, people who are in isolation uh, or people who are uh, COVID positive. And of course, I think there's no question there's going to be an advanced effort to uh, provide to make sure that we are ready for the next pandemic and all the things that may be required for that, whether it's technology on your iPhone or, or other device uh, or uh, uh, making sure that we're, um, you know, producing the PPE in the United States that will be available. Uh, so I think there's, there's an awful lot that I can see happening after this pandemic is over. Kelsey Landis at the Belleville News Democrat. We've heard reports saying IDPH's hospital resource numbers are incorrect in the Edwardsville region. Is IDPH aware of any discrepancies? And if so, are they working to correct them? She mentions that the numbers um, on the resource website are higher than some of the hospitals are saying they have available. Thank you for that question. So of course, IDPH is the repertoire of an, an in, <laughs> a lot of information and the information that we have is what information has been given to us so we have information that comes from each hospital every day we pull that information at midnight the information we get from whoever is assigned to give it to us is what we have if there are errors um, we recommend people have the people who are entering that data give the correct information but information out is what was the information in yeah. Kelly at Block Club for Dr. Azike, how can people safely open their quarantine circle, if at all, to family and friends who have also isolated? Can we safely hug or visit moms for Mother's Day? Ooh. The whole point of, uh, of where we are now is that I think we've tried to stress that, that we still don't have a cure. We still don't have uh, a vaccine. So we, re we really aren't... Uh, that far from where we were a month ago or before we started the stay-at-home order. So our, our elderly people are still at high risk, and we've had them essentially, you know, shelter in place. Even, you know, my mother, our, you know, the kids can only drop something off at the door because we don't want to 
expose her to any, any additional risk. So that really hasn't changed. And so we really don't want to put anyone at risk, especially our most vulnerable. So that really hasn't changed. Uh, her virtual hugs are still, I, say, I would say, the order of the day. Um, we want expanding your circle um, will increase uh, your risk of infection. It's, it's that simple. The more people you're around, the higher the risk of contacting, uh, contracting the virus from someone in this new expanded circle. So again, we are trying to minimize the risk for everyone. That's why staying home with that nuclear uh, established cell that you've had is the best way forward. As you expand that, you are absolutely increasing the risk of contracting the virus. Uh, Dr. Zika, this question is also sure. for you from Tina at the Sun-Times. More tests mean more cases, but with several days of 2,000 plus cases a day, when might we see that reflected in our hospitalization numbers? Is there a good percentage of how many people will enter hospitals from these counts? Also, is there a percentage of COVID-19 fatalities that have included comorbidities? I missed the last part, but in terms of, uh, right, cases go on to have a certain percentage of people who end up in the hospital, a certain percentage of the people who end up in the hospital end up in the ICU. Uh, so we know that about 30% of our cases, uh, of our total positive cases, have ended up in the hospital. So potentially we could see that going forward. Again, we're looking at the number of people who have been tested and as we've expanded testing, we have some less sick people who have had testing. So maybe that 30% won't hold going forward, but from previous numbers, we've had about 30% of people end up in the hospital. So assuming we had the same mix of people getting tests, uh, that could be the same. But again, as the uh, number of people tested has expanded, maybe this, uh, the illness, the baseline, um, status of those people might not be exactly the same. The last question was, uh, is there a percentage of COVID-19 fatalities that have included co comorbidities? Almost 90% almost of the fatalities have had an associated comorbidity, and uh, th we've seen that in, in data ac across the world. Uh, mostly, I mean, I actually have to add age. So age isn't necessarily a comorbidity, but it is uh, puts you in a higher risk status. So we have seen uh, people over the age of 65. We've talked about heart disease. We've talked about uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma, diabetes. So there's a list of conditions uh, which are quite common uh, in our population, uh, along with elevated age. Please don't forget pregnant women or people who have been recently pregnant are also at high risk. Anybody who has an immunocompromised status, maybe a recent um, cancer uh, patient or somebody who's actively going through chemotherapy. So there are a lot of people that form that group uh, that are in a higher risk category. Thank you. Hannah at the Daily Line. Governor, the Restore Illinois plan will last for months or even years until we have a vaccine, a treatment, or herd immunity. Do you plan to continue issuing 30-day disaster declarations and executive orders the whole time, or would you rather legislate the plan with the General Assembly knowing you might have to negotiate on some points? Look, I, I don't want to be in the position that I've been in, which is to put in emergency orders. Um, but I'll, I'll say that we're going to work through this together. I've certainly been in communication with uh, many, many legislators, have uh, worked with them to uh, determine what aspects of these emergency orders need to be changed, altered. I talked yesterday about how we've included their opinions in the Restore Illinois plan. I hope that we're out of this uh, situation of COVID-19 being prevalent and no treatment and no uh, vaccine. I hope we're out of this situation as soon as possible. And I'm you know, watching very carefully to see if there's a treatment or a vaccine that will come available very soon. But we're, we're no doubt about it. We're going to have to keep, you know, on top of this, do it as best we can. Um, you know, I'll work with the legislature in any way that they would like to work together. But my job and their job is to help keep the people of Illinois safe and healthy. She had one more uh, follow up. In terms mm -hmm. of determining whether a certain region is ready to move to the next phase, will infection data be weighted for congregate settings like prisons and residential homes since they're not necessarily representative of the community? You know, I've heard this question before, but I want to point out that there are staff people who go in and out of these facilities all the time. Um, and so even if you were to keep everybody in a nursing facility that's a resident, which 
is the case now unless somebody checks out and goes home with their family um, that you know you have staff coming in and out literally every day multiple shifts uh, many of those people live in the areas that those nursing homes and prisons uh, exist and so I, I don't think people should ignore the idea that there's an infection in one of these congregate settings thinking that it doesn't have any effect on the community so no we're not ignoring those uh, when the calculations are made about infection rates and and the number of people um, you know who go into the hospital uh, with COVID-19. Shruti at Bloomberg, the CME plans to reopen its options pits as early as three weeks after Illinois' stay-at-home order lifts. The exchange is asking traders to sign waivers and accept the risks because it can't guarantee safety once the floor opens. Can you comment? I really can't. I, I'm not sure what the circumstances are that are requiring that. Um, uh, Tiffany Walden at Tribe, one of our readers had to communicate to a fearful and scared group of employees that the office would be opening up June 1st. Will employers be given guidelines about how to safely open up offices? Yes. In fact, uh, we're working with industry groups and with um, workers' representatives, unions and others, as well as obviously with IDPH and experts in uh, epidemiology and and understanding COVID-19 to make sure that the rules that are put in place for each industry, um, manufacturing is different than warehousing is different than offices and so on, um, that all those rules will be made clear to people. And indeed, as you look in the plan that we put forward, uh, you'll see reference to IDPH safety guidance. Um, and of course, social distancing and face coverings will be the norm. Greg Hines at Cranes, would you please reply to some of the pushback from business groups, especially restaurants, who say giving them no hope of even partially reopening until the end of June is much tougher than nearby states and near certain to result in mass permanent closures? Well, my first response to that is that um, I'm not the one that's, um, you know, writing those rules for restaurants and bars. It is doctors and epidemiologists that I'm listening to. Um, and indeed, as many people, I think, understand, um, these are, you know, situations where you are naturally going to be putting people uh, close to one another. There are servers who will be serving food, which can transmit the disease, um, the infection, uh, bartenders, and so on. And so all of these things are playing a, a you know, an, uh, you know a, a role in the decision-making, I think, by the doctors and epidemiologists. Um, and Look, I, I also think that the public understands this. And even if you flung the doors open on bars and restaurants today, I think many people would say, I don't want to be in a public location like that, where it is more likely that things might be transmitted. So, but we very much want to get to opening the restaurants and bars. We need to see what the effect is on our hospitalizations and, and uh, infection rates across the state as we gradually open the economy. Um, and as we saw, you know, it is written into stage four, phase four, which is just the next phase right after this uh, phase three that might come up, uh, you know, for some regions in June. Jim Leach at WMAY. Governor, you are in charge of the state fair. Given your own criteria, is there any realistic way to consider holding the fair this year? I think it's highly unlikely that we'll be able to hold uh, our state fairs. You know, I've, I've been to the state fairs. I think many people have. Um, you know that this will be many people packed together in buildings or even on pathways. Uh, so, you know, I, I do not believe that we'll be able to open the state fair. But I do want to point out to people that I, something I said yesterday and I'm very hopeful for, and that is we have many treatments that are in the works. Um, the, the researchers and experts are hard at work now. There's one that's been um, emergency approved by the FDA uh, called remdesivir. I hope there will be many others. And maybe by the time these larger events roll around, we might be able to have a treatment that's very effective. And then I think there is the possibility. Marnie Pike at the Daily Herald. Some suburban Republicans say the four groups hamstring communities with low COVID-19 numbers by lumping them with Chicago. Could you respond? 
Remember that these uh, regions are based upon the hospital regions or the emergency medical service regions that have been set up for decades by the Department of Public Health. So really they're not based upon how many uh, uh, COVID positive people are in your particular village or town or city, but rather how many hospital beds and, and healthcare workers, how much healthcare is available if and when there is a surge. Um, and let's be clear, the virus hasn't gone away. It is still out there. And nothing that we're doing uh, now is changing that fact. What we have changed, what has made things better, what has reduced the number of uh, potential infections and the number of people going into the hospital and dying uh, is the fact that people have adhered to the stay-at-home order. And so the more we turn the dial up of you know allowing more and more interactions to occur in business and otherwise, the more risk that we're taking. We're going to be watching very closely. We all want the economy to open. I want it as much as anybody. Um, and I'm the one, you remember, I'm a business person. <laughs> At least before I became governor, I was a business person. And I'm the one who's debating these things with the scientists and epidemiologists. And they're making cogent, uh, well-founded arguments. And I'm listening to the science. Mark Maxwell at WCIA, you've said all along that a 14-day decline is the benchmark you need to see to lift restrictions. Now it's 28 days. What changed? Um, I would say a couple things. Uh, there are a lot of differences between the White House plan uh, that was put forward and our plan, but um, as you can see from the various plans across the country, uh, each one has a slightly different set of criteria. What we're watching for is the effect of uh, the, um, uh, you know, the on hospitalizations, on infections, and so on. But remember, we made changes just on May 1. So even if we were to watch this for just 14 days, what we've seen already is things are flat, not declining. So if I were to follow the White House plan to the letter, uh, we would not even have begun the 14 days that is suggested in the White House plan. But instead, what I'm suggesting is that if we have hospital beds available, uh, if we have the ability to provide health care for people, um, and we can see that there's a maintenance of that ability over a period of time, then we will be able to open things up. Uh, and I think, honestly, it might even be, uh, you know, because it's different than the White House plan, uh, indeed, uh, you know, makes things more available to open up than the White House plan would in Illinois. I think we're going to have to be very careful. That's why we have these 28-day periods. Uh, Brittany Clemens at WMBD News. As you know, some mayors decided to open up their city on May 1. Can businesses still lose their license if operating before the IDPH approves their region for their respective phase? They could. And, you know, the state often licenses some of these businesses, so they absolutely could. And we will be looking at each of those businesses to determine uh, whether we have the ability to do that and when we could do that. Emily Coleman, the Lake County Sheriff's Office said Monday they will not issue tickets or be able to enforce the two-person a boat rule because they have not received any guidelines for, for specific citations. Will you be providing more guidance to local authorities for enforcement? We can. We absolutely can do that. I mean, it's important that people adhere to the two-person per boat uh, guideline. It was really intended. We wanted people to be able to go out to go fishing, to be able to enjoy being on the water. Um, but, uh, but it's important that people be able to uh, enjoy social distancing while also being safe out there on a boat. So, uh, so we do want enforcement to take place, and we'll certainly be working with law enforcement as they ask us for assistance. Molly Parker at the Southern Illinois will be our last question from online. With bordering states opening earlier in many cases, how will that affect your Restore Illinois plan both health-wise and economically? Well, it certainly may make it more difficult because we will see potentially infections across the border. Um, I can't speak to the decision-making that's been made in those states. What I can say is um, I know that uh, Governor Holcomb in Indiana uh, shares the same goals that I do, which is to make sure that we're keeping people uh, safe and healthy. 
Uh, but I'm listening to the epidemiologists about what their best recommendations are in terms of timing and how we open these industries up. Uh, and I'm going to follow that. I'm going to do what's best for the people of Illinois. I know people of Illinois want to do what's best for themselves, uh, which means to me uh, not going into these places that clearly are going to be, uh, you know, potential hotbeds of infection uh, and then coming back into your community or into your home. Well, Governor, at least I don't have to worry about being asked how many more questions I've got. <laughs> well, you still might get cut off, so don't get excited. Um, so this morning, uh, you're well aware, I'm sure House Republicans held a press conference. They are uh, calling on a couple of things. One, they want the legislature to come back into session. Uh, they say IDPH has not provided a safe guidelines for doing that. Uh, what would you say to Speaker Madigan and Senate President Harmon about getting lawmakers back into session? Republicans want to work with you and compromise you as legislators for how we go forward and they feel you're kind of just dictating a one-person show. Well, that's kind of crazy. Let's just start with this. Uh, I have talked to the leaders on the Republican side, many Republican legislators. Um, I'm frequently reaching out, listening to them. I take a lot of notes and I've done a lot of the things that they've asked uh, along the way. They are legislators. I have great respect for the legislators on both sides of the aisle uh, and I am listening to them. They are acting as legislators and as a legislature. They are meeting in working groups. I know that Republicans and Democrats are sitting down talking about the budget. They're sitting down talking about uh, the Department of Human Services. They're talking about the various uh, functions of government. They're doing it, you know, in committee style, uh, Zoom conferencing and elsewhere and, and otherwise. Um, so they're doing exactly what I think they would be doing if they were in session having committee meetings. Um, and they absolutely have the ability to uh, get together in session. That's one of the reasons that we didn't just provide that, uh, you know, for no reason. We wanted to make sure that the legislature knew there are ways to do this. Now, let's also be clear that there are legislators who are concerned about getting together in uh, 177 of them, add in staff and all the other, the staff that work for them, not to mention all the other people who work in the Capitol uh, and maybe members of the public. I mean, that, that could be a potentially dangerous situation. That's why we we need the legislature to ask us for, you know, what guidance they may need uh, in order to get together, which we're, you know, showing you that we're willing to provide. So uh, a number of questions that also kind of go on some of the things that you've talked about. Um, and the question for, for some of these regions, you've lumped all 11 of your EMS hospital regions into four separate regions. Uh, for example, uh, mayors out in DuPage County are saying, how can you lump us in with Chicago? You're going to kill our businesses. Other, you know, communities are saying we're being lumped in with larger areas where there's a bigger problem. Why not break it down closer to the 11 separate EMS districts and, and do it that way? Well, again, we were trying to, this is all based upon hospital availability. Um, we thought it would be better uh, and more manageable for everybody if it was done in this number of regions. I'm sure that there are a lot of opinions about how you could draw the lines. I know I spoke with one or another DuPage County uh, mayors who wanted just to draw the lines around their city. Um, and so my view is that um, no matter how we drew these lines, uh, there were going to be people who might complain, but remember why they were drawn. They were drawn because we want to make sure that there is health care availability. I had to point out to some mayors in, in areas that uh, are around the Chicagoland area that many of the people that live in their villages or in their towns or in their cities go into the city of Chicago on a regular basis, perhaps on a daily basis. And so when they say, well, but they've, the problem's in Chicago, but not here, that's just wrong. You know, the people who live there are going to places where there is a, maybe a higher infection rate and coming back to their village or their town. Uh, Greg Bishop of Senate Square, is it realistic uh, to hold some parts of the economy at bay for a vaccine that doesn't exist or may not exist for 18 months? And can you provide more information on what a highly effective therapy looks like? Well, I'm not the one holding back the economy to, you know, to, from stage five. The COVID-19 virus is. Um, that's the thing that's been causing the very high infection rates, the uh, hospitalizations, and the deaths. 
Uh, so I would pay attention to the fact that that's still out there and the fact the reason that these rates have come down over the last two months has been because of uh, orders that we've put in place and the fact that people across Illinois are obeying those. I'm sorry, there was a second part of that question. Uh, do you have more information on what a highly effective therapy might look like? Um, I, I, I would love to Dr. turn it over Zager. to the doctor for that because I can't probably describe it well enough, but happy to have her describe. I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear. If we had something that would uh, decrease uh, the rate of fatalities, if it could re decrease the rate of people ending up in the hospital, you know, something that maybe can shorten uh, the severity such that people don't end up hospitalized, don't end up in the ICU, uh, anything like that would be a complete game changer in terms of people could say, well, maybe I could go out because it's less likely that I'll end up hospitalized, it's less likely that I'll end up in the ICU, it's less likely that I'll die, that you know, maybe something that would cause a situation where uh, elderly people weren't so disproportionately hit. And so if you interacted with grandma, you think that there's a treatment, should she get the virus, there's a treatment that she wouldn't die. So it's pretty clear like if we have something that is effective that we know can actually decrease either hospitalization rate or, or fatality, that would be a completely different story than what we have now. Um, Dr. Zika, while you're up there, another question that was directed towards you. Indiana is not using nursing homes, healthcare workers, or prisoners when it comes to their positivity rate. Is that a better way to determine the rate uh, in the general public? Again, I think, I think Governor Pritzker answered that very, very appropriately. People work there. There are uh, hundreds and thousands of people in a single facility, whether it's a, a, a group home or a prison or a jail or a nursing home. People are going in and out every single day, and those people return to communities. So those facilities are not separate from the communities in which they, they're part of the community. People make deliveries to those communities. Like it's it's definitely part of the community. So I can't, I can't separate it and say that that's not part. If there are significant outbreaks in the community, that is a significant warning sign because we know that that, uh, that infection is in the community, it's in the staff that work there that go back to their homes every night. And if I may, if I may just add to that, uh, remember that uh, the nursing home residents that live in that area get sick and uh, need a hospital and they need a hospital bed, and they need an ICU bed, and they may need a ventilator. And so that's part of why you know we have to include those because you're talking about the availability of healthcare when people get sick in that area. That's also true for prisoners in a prison, um, inmates in a prison, all, that's also true for group homes. So it's, it doesn't make sense to me to exclude the people who live in those residential communities or in those congregate settings uh, from the calculation. Now this is from Lauren Stouffer with NBC5, uh, and here's the context for you. Hinsdale approved a plan to close a downtown street so restaurants can have more space for outdoor dining. Under your plan, restaurants can open in phase four. Can they have their outside seating only, and can that account for social distancing, and can they open prior to the phase if they do that? That's not been the recommendation, again, of the epidemiologists. And, um, you know, so curbside delivery, uh, pickup, drive-through, uh, those, uh, de you know, uh, delivery to the home, those are all things that, that have been um, considered acceptable by the, by the experts. Uh, from Tim McNicholas with CBS2, the latest unemployment numbers published by the state are from mid-March and show it under 5%. What do you realistically think the unemployment rate is in Illinois and how much do you believe the pandemic is costing the state every day? Well, I think the unemployment rate is much higher than the rate that was in published in March. Any um, idea? I, 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 you know, I, the numbers will be published at some point, um, and you'll be able to see. Um, I, I think that I mean, it's this has had a terrible toll on the entire United States, and, and of course, on the people of Illinois. Um, and as to what it's costing us, I mean, look, beyond the cost to, to the state, uh, this has cost so many families so much. Um, their savings, many of their savings are gone. Uh, many of them have businesses that they're trying to keep alive. Uh, many of them have lost their jobs or, or are in danger of losing their jobs soon. 
Um, and that's one of the reasons why so much help needs to come from the federal government. Um, they are the ones who have uh, monetary policy, um, have the, you know, the levers that they can pull that are so much different than what states can do. Um, and so I'm, you know, we, we are going to need help, there's no doubt about it, uh, in order to uh, deal with the cost of this pandemic. Uh, Dermot Molina from CBS2. What has IDES completed to make sure that the system will be up and running Monday for 1099 workers? And, and, and just in addition to that, we're hearing there is continual, continual problems with the website. People just cannot get through. They're uh, having to make, you know, hundreds of attempts to even get through. Um, so uh, a couple of things. One is we're going to talk about this uh, later in the week. We're going to have a, uh, a complete presentation so people can see what's being done. And, um, uh, you know, in terms of people trying to get on the website, uh, the website actually has a very good uptime. So, you know, the, the idea that the website is crashing for everybody, that shouldn't be the case. That doesn't seem to be the case. Having said that, I'm sure there are people who have had trouble. Um, but remember that the many, many, many applications Applications have been processed, 800,000 applications or more, uh, and the numbers of people, um, you know, that we've seen that are having trouble are, uh, you know, a, a fraction of that. That doesn't make it any easier, I know. And so that's why we've increased so significantly the ability for people to call in. And I know that even that can be difficult sometimes, but I would ask for people's patience. And, and those who are having significant difficulty, um, you know, they may be logged in but not able to get their uh, benefits and it, it, that may be because there is a an arbitration that needs to take place that hasn't yet taken place and we're working through all of those um, this from Elizabeth Matthews at Fox 32 and I don't know if this is for you or dr. Zeke does your reopening plan address long-term care facilities when can things get back to normal at nursing homes and when can families visit their loved ones living in those homes yeah, it doesn't um, address that I mean obviously when we get to, to phase five um, then, you know, we will not have uh, the same issues. But um, look, the great concern here is that the, this, pan this uh, epidemic, this virus is uh, so dangerous uh, for elderly people and uh, particularly those in congregate settings. So um, I'm deeply concerned about it. I, I couldn't speak to what the timing would be for lifting restrictions on nursing homes, but perhaps Dr. Zika has an opinion. So again, it ties into the same thing that we've been saying, um, I guess, all afternoon, that no, nothing in this situation has changed to decrease the risk for that most vulnerable population. Um, when there is a game changer, when there is a, a treatment that would be able to counter the devastation that we have seen thus far uh, in, in our long-term care facility, we, we can think about loosening it at, right now trying to open up visitation to create more contacts for this group that has um, already been so hardly hit. It, it doesn't seem like the right thing to do. It doesn't seem like an act of protection. It actually seems that it's it's, it would be increasing their risk. Well, you're there, Dr. Zeke, mm -hmm. from my colleague, uh, Michelle Gallardo at ABC7. Um, how, do you, how quickly do you expect to hire the 3,800 people that you say you need for contact tracing and all, there's a second part that I've used so I want to address that first if you will sure so the contact tracing effort which we have been talking about is a robust you know we gave the estimate about maybe needing maybe 4,000 people we are not going to have 4,000 people start at once this month uh, we will start to on board some people. Of course, remember that contact tracing is something that is done by every local health department already now. People are, you know, trying to identify the cases, uh, but the problem is as, as the numbers have grown, we've uh, gone larger than the than the staff that's in place can can do. So we have people at the local health department. We have community health uh, workers. We have uh, different people who are already have already been engaged in this kind of work before. We have some of the grantees of IDPH that already does this kind of work. We have people who have signed up for uh, to be volunteers uh, through Illinois Help. So we are going to be using the resources that are in place to get started, and then we're going to scale up uh, with time to get the full number that we need. But it's going to be a, a gradual process and not something where you know we'll have 4,000 in place uh, next week. 
And I'll just add that there are hundreds, as Dr. Zika is implying, hundreds of people who do contact tracing even now uh, who will be part of that broader effort. Uh, this was from maybe Jacobson and also for Dr. Zika. Um, no. Sorry, you're doing the, the, the <laughs> dance to the microphone. Um, what percent of nursing homes are in compliance with the state regulations, uh, their preparedness for a viral outbreak? Right, so everyone is supposed, there's a list of infection control guidelines that have been reviewed and reviewed. We have weekly webinars. We have obviously been sending people in to, you know, look at that. We have people who have been talking, uh, you know, teams that are talking to the infection control teams at the facilities. So again, I think everyone is aware uh, of these standards. You know, there's regular surveys that occur for these long-term care facilities. So we identify deficiencies on the regularly scheduled surveys but you know as with anything if you don't keep up the things you're supposed to be doing there there could be laxes and so you know sometimes that is what is causing some of these outbreaks some is just that you know with asymptomatic spread it is very difficult to even know that someone uh, potentially is spreading the virus so there really isn't uh, a perfect solution where you could prevent every case and once it has gotten into the facility uh, it's probably already started to spread again before we know because of that asymptomatic transmission and uh, not clear what percentage of transmission is asymptomatic but we know that that is a part and so it makes it very hard to contain something that you can't even see in the form of a, an infection or transmission by someone that you don't even know is, is transmitting at the time. Craig, this is your last one. This will be the last one. Well, let me ask this for Maria Palmo from uh, Telemundo. Uh, it says, we border the states of Indiana and Wisconsin. Does the state of Illinois get notified when Illinois residents die or test positive for COVID-19 in either Indiana or Wisconsin? Does, uh, do we get notified when someone...